seat. You know, I think one of the greatest privileges as a believer is not just the idea that when we die, we're going to go to heaven. But I think one of the greatest experiences as a believer is to be able to walk and sense the love of God, sense the acceptance of God. I think there's no greater feeling in the world than to be able to walk even in the midst of the darkness of this world and sense that God loves me, that God has reached out, that God knew me before I was ever born, and he made a way for me to come to him. You know, when we look at the word of God, we see this, this grand picture of the love of God. We see this picture that is painted for us that man sinned, and therefore man had a problem. And the problem was that his sin separated him from God. And that ultimate problem was going to be that he was going to get to the end of his life. He was going to breathe his last and close his eyes and the last heartbeat. And he was going to leave this world and he was going to go off into eternity separated from Almighty God. Man had a problem. But God had a problem too. And that problem was that he wanted to be close to man. He wanted to draw close to man, and sin served as an obstacle that kept man at a distance. And so what God did, as we most of us know in this room, is he solved that problem by sending Jesus in flesh. You see, the ultimate thing, if we could say, if we could just distill the heart of God, the plan of God, the word of God, if we could just distill the gospel down into the most simple terms, this is what it would be, that God wants to be close to you, and sin was an obstacle, and he loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to die for your sin, remove that obstacle, not just so that you could be saved from hell, but so that he could be close to you. He would come into relationship with you. And this is the great mystery of God that has been unveiled unveiled to us in these last days, that God wants to be close to his people, and he sent his one and only son to remove that barrier and obstacle from us being close to him. This morning, I want to preach a message to you that I've entitled, The Witch, the Prophet, and the First King of Israel. I remember back when I was in eighth grade, we were in the lunchroom, and there was a guy who was a little bit different than everybody else in the school, and he was sitting at a table, and people were going to the table one by one, and he was reading their palms. He was, he was saying that he could read the future of people by reading their palms. And so I actually went up to him, and I I actually was just joking. I really was kind of making fun of him. That's what I was really doing. And so I went up to him, and I held my palm out, and I said, go ahead, read my palm, see what you see. And so he took my hand, and he began to crease the lines of my palm, and he began to look at it. And he said to me, well, I can see that when you're about 30, you're going to begin to have some heart problems, but you'll get through that okay. And I took my hand back away from him and I said that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life and I just I made fun of him but when I was about 30 I began to have some heart problems and what I found out was that I had magnesium deficiency and I started to take magnesium and it solved that problem but nonetheless I had heart problems And that kind of made me stop for just a moment and think, as I look back, even though I was joking, even though I was making fun of the guy, by reaching my palm out to him, I opened myself up to something. And I think it's important for us to understand that there is a kingdom of darkness and there is a kingdom of light. And God has called us to walk in the kingdom of light and to not mess with the kingdom of darkness. Everybody say amen. Amen. Now, even though I was joking and even though I was being sarcastic, it is strange how things unfolded. But we need to recognize that the power of darkness is real and it causes people to be captured every single day. Whether it's horoscopes where people innocently open up the newspaper and they, they read their horoscope, 
or whether it's Ouija boards. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if you ever had a Ouija board. I did have a Ouija board when I was young. I asked my mom and dad to buy that for me. And I had some friends come over and we did the whole Ouija board thing and some real weird and strange things happen. I see a lot of advertisements about psychics and there are even Christians I know that have called up on the psychic hotline and got their, their future read by these so-called psychics. They're becoming very, very big. You know, you dial up the phone and somebody answers and says, hi, this is Matilda the psychic. What can I do for you? <laughs> Did you hear about the guy that went to see the psychic? He goes up to the psychic's door, knocks on the door, and hears from inside, who is it? He left. <laughs> now, even though all these things are fake, with a spiritual dynamic behind them, there's a lot of people that are fooling a lot of people, but they are opening themselves up to spirits of darkness. And we have got to be a people that understand and discern that fooling around with the things of darkness is not just good fun. Fooling around with the things of darkness is opening ourselves up for demonic bondage, and we need to understand that. It might seem like harmless fun, but we don't want to give the devil a place in our life. But as we think about these things, and especially as we think about these things around this time that we call Halloween, we think, why do people get themselves involved with these things? Why do people? Why, I, I, I understand why unbelievers do. Unbelievers get themselves involved because I think every human being understands that there's something beyond them. There's something more than just the physical life that's here. They were created to be spiritual beings. And so there is a void in their heart, and they are reaching out for something to worship, something to grab a hold of, something that is greater than their own reality. And so an unbeliever would reach out for anything that seemed amazing or spiritual or might give them some insight about the future. But there are even believers, there are even Christians who are going to some of these psychics and mediums and, and, and other occult things. They're going, and why are they doing that? I think the reason they're doing that is that they've never understood that they can walk and talk with Almighty God. Everybody say amen. amen. They've never understood that they can hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. They can get the leading of the Holy Spirit on the inside of their life. And really what is happening here is there has been a satanic deception to cause people to think that they have to go to another source of wisdom, another source of insight, another source of revelation, because they have not understood that the God we serve is a God who wants to talk to his people. One of the greatest heart's desires, and you've heard me teach this before, one of the greatest heart's desires of God is that he would be close to his people. As I said, this is what salvation is about. Salvation is not just about saving all of us from the lake of fire. Salvation is about that God looked at you and wanted you to be close to him, wanted to pull you close and embrace you for all of eternity. He wanted to be friends with you. He wanted to have relationship with you. That's what salvation is about. And a part of relationship is communication of hearts and minds and a joining together in a friendship. And this is what God calls us to. We have a great privilege that the Holy Spirit comes to live on the inside of us because sin has been dealt with by Jesus Christ and his shed blood on the cross. Now the God of all the universe can come to live on the inside of us. And as I said, it's always been his desire. He wants to dwell in the midst of his people. He wants his people to say, you are my God. And he wants to look at his people and say, you are my people. 
And we see this from the beginning in the garden. And we see his desire all the way through until it goes into the book of Revelation where we see in eternity he has his way, he has his will, exactly what is happening. There he is. He's in the midst of his people. The father with his children gathered around him. What a beautiful, beautiful picture. And so even as we have gone through the book of Judges, and last week we began to look in 1 Kings, we began to look at, or 1 Samuel, we began to look at God's desire to gather his people around him, to speak to them, to walk with them, to have a relationship with them. And we need to be a people that not only know ourselves, that God wants to talk with us and walk with us and be our friend and have a relationship with us, but as we share the gospel with people out there, it is not just fire and brimstone, do you want to go to hell or not? That is not what it's about. What it's about is, do you want to know God as a friend? Do you want to have those obstacles removed that you could walk with the, with the God who created everything that you see? Do you want that kind of relationship with God? That's what the gospel is about. As we've been going through, and last week we began to look at the life of Samuel, we said there that Samuel had become this judge of Israel. And he was the picture of what God wanted. He was the man who now had, had brought the nation together. He, he, had, he had accomplished the desire of God's heart in the nation of Israel, and that is to bring the people together, centered around God, with God as their king, God in the midst of his people. This is what Samuel had begun to accomplish there. He was the last judge of Israel. He was a judge. He was a priest. He was a prophet. Finally, God had a man there in leadership that God would have exactly what he wanted. God was the king in the midst of the people. A beautiful balance. Samuel was a prophet and recognized God as king. He didn't take that authority upon himself, but pointed the people to God as the king and rallied them around him. And when Samuel became old, something unfortunate happened. The people came to Samuel and said, guess what, Samuel? Thanks for your service but you're getting kind of old. You're not going to be here forever. We really don't like your sons. And so here's what we want. We want a king. Because we want to be like all of the other nations around us. We want a king. In 1 Samuel chapter 8, verse number 4, this is what it says. So all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, you are old, and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint a king to lead us, such as the other nations have. But when they said, give us a king to lead us, this displeased Samuel. So he prayed to the Lord, and the Lord told him, listen to what God said to the prophet. The nation said, we don't want God as our king, we want a physical king, a flesh and blood king. We want to be like all the other nations. And the Lord said to Samuel, listen to all that the people are saying to you. It is not you they have rejected, but they have rejected me as their king. God looked at what the people were doing and saw that as a rejection of him as their king. In other words, what was happening was God was being pushed to the side, no longer to be the king, and they wanted a mere man to lead them. So, as we go through this story, we understand that the first king of Israel is Saul. And God does use Saul for a time. He does use him to defeat the Philistines, but he also clearly disobeys God. Samuel, the prophet, does die, and in Saul's darkest moment, he doesn't know what to do. You know why he doesn't know what to do? 
because he never really had a relationship with God. He had some experiences with God. The Holy Spirit came upon him several times and even prophesied. And he built some altars and, and he asked the prophet to pray for him. And he was a religious man, but he himself never really had a walk with God himself. We see over and over again that he did not trust God. He did not obey God. He was a man that walked in disobedience. And now Samuel was gone. He had died. And he had gone and tried to build an altar to God. And he tried to pray. But God had already said, I've rejected you as being king because you just can't obey me. And so God did not answer him. And so, in his desperation, he turns to a witch at Endor. 1 Samuel 28, 13 says, the king said to her, now he's going to this witch at Endor because what he's hoping to do is to call up Samuel, who is dead, call up the spirit of Samuel, and that Samuel could give him some advice. I mean, that is in a bad place when you got nobody to get advice from except a dead guy, that is a really tough spot to be in. And the king said to her, don't be afraid. What do you see? And the woman said, I see a spirit coming up out of the ground. What does he look like, he asked. An old man wearing a robe is coming up, she said. Then, Samuel, or then Saul knew it was Samuel, and he bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. And Samuel said to Saul, Why have you disturbed me by bringing me up? I'm in great distress, Saul said. The Philistines are fighting against me, and God has turned away from me. He no longer answers me, either by prophets or by dreams. And so I have called on you to tell me what to do. This was a big mistake. Everybody say amen. Samuel said, why do you consult me now that the Lord has turned away from you and has become your enemy? The Lord has done what he predicted through me. The Lord has torn the kingdom out of your hands and given it to one of your neighbors, to David, who will be the second king of Israel. Because you did not obey the Lord or carry out his fierce wrath against the Amalekites, the Lord has done this to you today. The Lord will hand over both Israel and you to the Philistines, and tomorrow you and your sons will be with me. In other words, you're going to die. The Lord will also hand over the army of Israel to the Philistines. And then verse 20 says, Immediately Saul fell full length on the ground, filled with fear because of Samuel's words. His strength were gone, for he had not eaten anything from that day to that night. Now, as we follow this story along, the, the story of Saul just gets darker and darker and darker. His mind begins to go. He's tormented by evil spirit. He, he is falling into desperation and discouragement and depression. And as you watch what is happening to this man, if you have any compassion at all, you look at him and your heart goes out for him. You, you feel the pain that he is feeling, but you also understand that he has built this house of pain that he's experiencing by his own choices. And we also understand this because you and I have this beautiful perspective. We can look back now and we can look at the whole of God's word and we can understand who God is. And here's what we know. What we know is God is merciful. God is great in compassion and loving kindness. Everybody say amen. And there was a road back. There could have been a road back for this guy who had fallen so far. And he could have fallen upon the mercy of the Lord, but he never took that road. God responds to brokenness. But we never saw a real brokenness of heart towards the Lord. There was a brokenness towards his situation. He knew he was in a bad situation. But there was never a brokenness towards the Lord. There was never a time of true and real 
heartfelt repentance before God. And so we look at this story and we say, I say anyway, because I, I ask when I read scripture, I, I, questions just come up. And this is how God teaches me. You step back from this story of Saul, the first king of Israel, when, when God wanted to be their king and the, the people came and said, no, we want a flesh and blood king. And God says, okay, we'll give him a king. You say, why did God give him Saul? God understood what was going to happen with Saul. Why did God give him Saul? Because they asked for a king and God himself did choose Saul. So why this king? Why this guy? And I believe it's for this reason, that God wanted them to see a contrast. Just like when we look back in the book of Judges and the beginning of Samuel, we see that um, you have Eli, who was this corrupt priest, and then God is bringing up Samuel, and we have this picture of the old and the new. We have this picture of the bad and the good. We have this picture of Eli, who is this corrupt priest, and we have this picture of Samuel, who truly is a man who wants to follow God and that God can use, and God wants us to see the comparison between Eli and Samuel. And God here is also wanting us to see the comparison between Saul and then the second king of Israel, David. He wants us to see them so that we understand, so that we can learn from their lives as we watch them walk with God. We can learn and we can understand how we should and how we shouldn't walk from Almighty God. He's providing a contrast. He wanted Israel to see the difference between that first and that second king, Saul and David. Saul was the kind of king that the people wanted. He was the kind of king that it was all about outward appearance. He was a tall guy. He was a good looking guy. He was a strong guy. He was the kind of guy that you would look at and say, yeah, that guy looks like a king. David, not so much. David was somebody, actually, when, when he first got tapped by God, he was just a young man, a young boy. He was just a shepherd. Nobody thought he could be a king. But for Saul, it was about appearance. But for David, it was about the heart. You see, God does not look on appearance. God looks on the hearts. And this is what he is showing us today in this comparison between Saul and David. They were very, two very different type of men. Samuel had once said to Saul, when Samuel was still alive, he says, you acted foolishly. You have not kept the command of the Lord your God that he gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. And the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him leader of all the people because you have not kept the Lord's command. As I said, there's a big difference between Saul, the first king, and David, the second king. There's a big difference. Saul, at best, was a religious man. As I said, he had some experiences with God. He even had some experiences with the Holy Spirit. He even prophesied. But David was a man who just loved to be with God. Now, let's not miss this for a second. You know, sometimes when we judge a situation, we look and we say, well, what kind of skills do they have? What kind of interpersonal ability do they have? What kind of training do they have? And we begin to evaluate whether or not this person would fit based upon many outward things. But what God saw in David was, here's a guy that just liked to be with him. That little word is so powerful, with, with. I told you that in the beginning, God's desire all the way through his word is he wants to be with his people. And so his question to us is, do you want to be with him? Do you want to be in his presence? Do you want to walk with him? Do you want to be his friend? Do you want him to be your friend? 
David's greatest asset was he just loved to be with God. To sense that God was near, to be with him. In Psalm chapter 8, verse number 1, this is a psalm written by David. This is a psalm that David, as he was a little shepherd boy, out at night watching over the sheep, He's looking up at the stars, he's looking up at the blackness of night, and he's just struck with the awe of the creation of God. He's just struck with what he is seeing before him. He sees the magnitude of what God has created, and he feels small in its presence, but he's just drawn to it like a moth to the flame, and he writes, O oh Lord! Our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above all the heavens. And from the lips of children and infants you have ordained praise because of your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. And when I consider the heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, David is struck with that and he says, What is man? that you're mindful of him, the son of man, that you care for him. He goes on in his, in his being just captured and blown away by what he's seeing before him and said, you made him, you made man a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. You made him ruler over the works of your hands and put everything under his feet all flocks and herds and beasts of the field and the birds of the air and the fish of the sea and all that swim the paths of the sea. Oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. David is looking out there and he's saying, who are we that you would trust us with your creation? Do you see the humility in the heart of David? That little boy, that little shepherd boy out there watching over the sheep at night, looking at the stars and looking at the moon. He is struck in awe with the idea that God would give this creation into the hands of mere mortal men. This is the kind of heart that God is looking for. It was the heart of David. Both men, Saul the first king and David the second king, both men felt God's presence leave them due to their sin. You see, both men were human beings, and both men, they made mistakes. But how they addressed those mistakes were very, very different. As I said, Saul trying to get back into the good graces of God, he builds an altar, and that didn't work. And Saul goes and he, he asks God, should I attack the Philistines? And God wasn't talking to him. You see, God never, God never heard a prayer from Saul. God, I'm broken before you. I've sinned. I'm flat, poured out on the floor. I've got nothing left. And then Saul not only refused to repent in brokenness and throw himself upon the mercy of God, but instead he turned and went to the witch at Endor to seek advice from a dead spirit. How did David deal with his sin? And we know that his sin was great. We know that he committed adultery. We know that, that not only did he commit adultery with Bathsheba, but he also put Bathsheba's husband in a position where he knew he would be killed. And so in essence, he killed her husband. This was great sin before God. And as the king of Israel, it's something that never, 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 never should have happened. And God could have easily said, you're done. But here's what David did in Psalm 51, verse number one. And it tells us a little bit about why David wrote this psalm. It says that this is for the director of music. It says it's a psalm of David when the prophet Nathan came to him after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba. He writes this as he goes before God 
in repentance, seeking the mercy of God. He says, have mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely your desire is for truth in the inner parts, and you teach me wisdom in the inmost place. David goes on to say to God, cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness and let the bones you have crushed rejoice instead. Hide your face from my sins and blot out my iniquity. Verse number 10, David cries out to God, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Cast not me from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Two very different men. Saul tried to manipulate God a little bit, going to build an altar. David threw himself on the ground before God and said, David, I'm a bro-. He said, God, I'm a broken man. I'm a broken man, and I need your mercy. God says to us, as we look at these two kings, we're, we're to see the difference. We're to learn something. First of all, we're to learn the humility and seeking of the mercy of Almighty God. You know, one of the things that I would, I would ask anybody that came to me and said, I'm, I'm having this issue in my life and I'm having this trouble and I just can't seem to get over it. One of the first questions I'm going to ask you is this. Have you gone before God? Have you got on your face before God? Have you cried out to him? Have you let your heart be broken before him? Have you become a broken man or a broken woman and you just laid there sobbing before the Lord? waiting upon the mercy of God to reach down and to lift you up and to brush you off and say, stand up, my child, because you're mine. And we're going to walk on together. I would ask people, have you ever done this? Have you ever had this experience in your life where you just poured out your heart before God and you've held nothing back? He's looking for a people that will have a contrite heart and a broken spirit, looking for people who will come in that kind of, of grief and repentance so that he can reach down and bring cleansing and new life to our hearts. As we look at David, we see that David did not look at the kingdom that he had been given and look out across it and say, I'm the king and this is my kingdom. It's my way or the highway. That is what David did. But Saul, on the other hand, Saul came and looked at the kingdom and he said, I'm the king and this is my kingdom. David looked at the kingdom. He saw that he was a king, but here's how he saw it. He saw that he was a king under the kingship of the ultimate king, almighty God. David saw God as king Big K, capital K. And he was king, little king. He was a little king. You had the big king, you got the little king. And David didn't get those two confused. He understood this concept, concept of, of stewardship. He understood that he was a shepherd for God over the kingdom of Israel. He understood that it was not his job to just rule, but it was his job to shepherd and care for those that had been given under his charge. And when we look at this story this morning, it, it teaches us as we look at the character of the first king of Israel, Saul, and we look at the character of the second king of Israel, David. 
And it's meant to show us these pictures so that we in our heart understand what is good and what is bad. So that we in our heart can ask the question, do I want to be more like Saul or do I want to be more like David? And the answer is obvious. Because each one of us, in a sense, have been given a kingdom. Each one of us have been given authority over a sphere, sphere of influence that is in your life. And so the question is, how do we handle that kingdom that God has given us? How did Saul handle the kingdom that he was given? How did David handle the kingdom that he was given? And how do we handle the kingdom that we have been given? We ask ourselves, what is our first priority or what is God's first priority in our life? That we see ourselves as stewards, that we do not have ownership of anything. God has given these things into our hand to care for, to bless, to protect, to be responsible with, and to be thankful for these things, even to the point of our family. When I think about Jennifer and I think about my kids, I say she's my wife, but she's not my property. Everybody say amen. She'd say amen too. She would say, if she's in here, she'd say a loud amen. That's right. And my kids are not my property. They're just given into my care for a time. I have authority, but I have responsibility. So whether it's a pastor over a church, a CEO over a company, or whether it's the President of the United States, they're not kings. They're not the ultimate rulers. They are stewards. They are shepherds. They are under the great king of all the universe. They submit their leadership. They submit their authority under his authority. And so this story calls us to ask in our own heart, how are we doing with the authority that has been given to us? You know, they say that true character comes out in four different situations. The first is this, through things and money. We all know it. We've all seen the stories of people kind of going along in their life until they win the lottery. And then things really get bad because that money destroyed them. Sometimes the things, the houses and cars or whatever, the things that we accumulate in life, how do we handle them? How we handle them reveals the character that we have. Secondly, authority. How do we handle authority? You know, it's one of the, it's one of the toughest things in the world to handle. Everybody wants it, but it's one of the toughest things in the world to handle because we're human beings and we're given to sin. And so what, whatever it is, whether it's the President of the United States, whether it's a pastor, whether it's a, a business owner, whether it's, it's somebody that's supervising at the factory, whatever it is, when somebody is placed into a place of authority, one or two things usually happens. They continue to be who they are or they change into somebody else. And we've seen this happen in people's lives, even within the church, given a place of authority, and all of a sudden, the personality changes because it brings out things that are revealed in the character of that person. Another issue, another area that brings out character is trouble. What do we do with trouble? We all have trouble. We're all going to have trouble. And when trouble comes into our life, it causes who we truly are, to come to the surface. It reveals character. And then temptations, any kind of temptation that comes into our life, it reveals who we really are. How do we handle that temptation? As I said, God gives us Eli and Samuel to compare. God gives us Saul and David to compare. So we can ask ourselves the question, who do we want to be like? How do we want to live? How should we handle the authority that God has given us in this world? 
And so this word of God always brings us to the place, no matter where we're at, what book we're at, what life we're studying, it always brings us to the place where it asks us the question, how is your heart? How are you doing? How would you have handled that situation that you were in? It causes us to be reflective of what is going on on the inside of us. The Holy Spirit will teach us as we go through these pages of this book and bring us to the point where we understand who we are. We understand this about God. We understand that God does not want to rule you. He does not want to control you. What God wants is to draw you close. He wants you to draw you close to himself. This is why Jesus came. This is why he died on the cross. This is why he shed his blood so that all the obstacles can be removed and he can reach in and embrace us, fill us with the Holy Spirit and live on the inside of us forever. But there's some strange thing that keeps going on in the heart of mankind. And that is that man very often wants to walk with God at a distance, with his hands out, saying, only this far, God, I don't want to come any closer. But the truth is, is this, we're missing out on so much because all of the All of the answers that we need, all of the power that we need, all of the help that we need is found the closer we get to God. And so as we look at the story of Saul and David, we understand this, that God loves us. God wants us to see what is good and what is bad. And God wants us to know that he wants to be close to us and draw us near and have us with him for all of eternity. Amen? Would you stand with me? Worship team, come on back. 